Hello everyone and welcome into the Lore Council. This is Cade and I am joined, of course, with Keith. Howdy, y'all. Howdy indeed. And today we are going to be talking about everybody's favorite 2021 adaptation of a 1965 sci-fi novel, Dune Part 1. I think it came out in like 1953 or something like that, like the 50s. Uh, Wikipedia says 1965. Oh, hmm. interesting. Yeah. So, um, overall, I guess spoiler free. I mean, if you haven't seen the movie by now, that's kind of your own fault. But uh, yeah, I, I really, really enjoyed the movie. Dune was something to me that was always um, intimidating to get into. So before this, I never really got into it, and the '80s movie looked a little too dated, I guess, to where I never really ever wanted to get into it. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm not sure why, but the the Dune, the classic Dune movie from the '80s, and then just the book, uh, just seemed very dry to me, you know. Uh, before when I tried watching them, um, I watched the original '80s movie for the first time, like uh, in preparation for the the reboot or the remake coming out. And uh, yeah, I liked I liked it. I thought it was fine. It definitely has some wacky stuff in it. And this new adaptation uh, definitely tries to stay as far away from all that wacky stuff and just keep it as close to the book as possible. Nice. Yeah, it was a uh, it was it was a really fun watch. I watched it at home. <clears throat> um, it had come. It did come out in theaters. I didn't go see it just because I I was pretty <laughs> broke at the time. So uh, thirty bucks at the movies couldn't swing it. So. Uh, just watched it at home on HBO Max, but I, I really enjoyed it. We had the lights out. Um, we have a 60-inch TV in the living room, so we were watching that from, like, seven feet away. So it, it was still a good uh, experience. Still has captured all the really good wide shots and the cinematography and everything. So really enjoyable experience watching it. Plus, there were no loud, annoying people, which, if you need any of my opinions yeah. on that, uh, watch the watch the No Way Home review we did. Yeah, and uh, I watched it at home as well, and I had a fantastic time. Uh, I actually watched it in two parts, and I thought it was great. Nice, Thanks. Yeah. Uh, home viewing. Yeah, and that's the great thing about viewing stuff at home. I'm glad it's becoming a more like viable option. Uh, it's it's nice to be able to just like sit and chill, maybe have like a couple people over, uh, and just and just kick back and watch a movie, and not have to pay, you know, movie theater price. And for me, and just not having the distraction of other people, like, you know, like, pretty, pretty, distraction is pretty much just totally out of the picture, you know, when you're watching it, you're, you know, your place. And, uh, yeah, that really just helps me to just get super immersed in the movie and like the movie. It's almost like if I'm at a movie theater and people are being annoying, I could just, like, it might, like, ruin the movie for me. Mm -hmm. And I might just not like the movie just because my whole viewing experience was, like, ruined. Yeah, no, it's definitely. Uh... Oh, but but uh, yeah, so this is pretty cool. It uh, kind of interesting. Came out, you know, HBO Max is doing the same day premieres thing, so it came out the same day as the theater thing. So, very convenient. And uh, yeah, I really really liked it. Uh, the, I just thought it was super cool. I just I got to do it right away. I had like some preparation for a lot of the ideas because I watched the original movie. Uh, Cade, you didn't watch the original movie, so you were, you just went into this, like, fresh? Yep, yep, fresh. I haven't read um, anything of Dune. I know that it exists, and it's about big space worms. Yeah, and I've now read the Dune book, well, most of it, and I think the I think the movie did a really good job, and I, uh, yeah, I don't hate the movie. After reading the book, I'm like, no, it did, did pretty well. Yeah, no, uh, it was definitely, definitely fun, and not nearly as intimidating uh, to get into, as I thought. Obviously, I've only seen it once, so I'm sure upon further rewatches and if I decided to read the novel and stuff, uh, I think it would definitely definitely be something I could get into, at least the main Dune series by Frank Herbert. I don't know if I would get into all the spin-offs and stuff that, is, that have come out. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see how I'm feeling after I finish uh, the first book. But, uh, yeah, Dune. Dune, yeah, so... Uh, what do you remember? What year this takes place in? Yeah, it is the year like ten thousand. 
Yeah, the year 10,000. So it is in the way, way far future, 8,000 years ahead of us. Yep. And, uh, yeah, basically... It's like uh, the exact opposite of Star Wars. It's, uh, it's our galaxy in the future. Yeah, it is a very near galaxy far into the future, as opposed to a galaxy a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Exactly. Yeah, so... Um, but basically, uh, and and you're going to be a bit more familiar with everything uh, than I am, but so essentially uh, House Atreides gets assigned by the Emperor to replace uh, the Harkonnen as the rulers of Arrakis, which is the planet where Spice is, it's like the only place in the galaxy it can be harvested, and they need it for interstellar uh, faster than light travel. Yeah, the uh, the spacing guild uses spice to like look into the future and like plan out like uh, space routes and stuff. And they fold space, although you don't really see it in this movie. But uh, it's kind of kind of interesting how they don't they don't really show the travel at all. They just kind of get from one place to another. Yeah, um... yeah but uh, yeah, it's kind of. A very uh, like Game of Thrones style plot, you know. They're like it's basically uh, space feudalism. You know, they have uh, like the Duke Leto Atreides. He's assigned a new fief of Arrakis, so he's now ruler of the planet, in, you know, in the, in the stead of the Harkonnens. And yeah, they gotta get the uh, they gotta get the H off of Caladan. Yeah, which is the uh, ocean planet, the exact opposite of uh, yeah, it's... Arrakis. Yeah, Caladan looks like super. It looks great to live. It's like temperate. It's nice. It's very scenic and pretty to look at. And then it's very contrasted by Arrakis, which is uh, a desert. It is a desert with giant worms. But we'll get to them later. Yeah, uh, color palette wise, it's like the exact opposite of Dune. It's you know, it's blue. Or, uh, Dune is uh, as soon as you get there, it's like whoa, yellow, yellow and red. And brown. Yeah, and shades I was gonna say of, yeah. Well, shades of everything in between. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so basically we find out. I don't remember if we find out at this point, but um, basically the Harkonnens are gonna stage a coup to retake Arrakis with the aid of the Emperor's like super troopers, basically, and so they can uh, eradicate House Atreides because they're starting to like threaten the Emperor's control. Yeah. So. The Emperor basically only assigns uh, the, du the Duke Dune uh, to to send him there to die, basically. The yeah. whole thing is a trap for the Atreides. Yeah, and I really... Um, I like that we don't see the Emperor of Dune. I think that's, that's pretty cool. Or the Emperor of Dune, uh, the Emperor of the Galaxy. I really like that we don't yeah. see him. We only see him through like his messengers to the Baron Harkonnen. Yeah, uh, yeah, you don't really see him a lot in the book either, so yeah, definitely very uh, mysterious there. Yeah, and then I believe also, obviously, at this point, we would be we would have been introduced to the protagonist of the uh, of the movie, uh, Paul Paul Atreides, played by Timothy Chalamet. Yeah, he does a really good job of just being like super broody. Yeah, very broody, very teenage. How old is he supposed to be? He's supposed to be like 15. Uh, well, he looks the part. I think so that's good. For sure. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, I don't I don't think Timothy Chalamet is like especially old. I'm assuming he's probably about my age, but uh yeah, he he pulls off looking Oh yeah, he is Oh, he's yeah, he was literally born 2 months after me, so. Uh-huh. Nice. Yep. Uh, but yeah, no, he he does do a really good job. Um and we're also introduced to uh, Duke Leto's... Is it his wife, or is that he how is it works? His, uh, she is technically his concubine. So they aren't married. Yeah, okay. but uh, she's basically his woman. She She's, you know, the wife of his... I'm the wife, the mother of his child. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, she's Bene Gesserit trained. Uh, and the, they don't, I don't think they say it in the movie, or they might, but in the book they basically say he stays single in order to, like keep the possibility of you know marrying with another house to create an alliance sure you know very game of thrones ish yeah and yeah uh yeah she's got the bed jesuit training uh it's not really a thing they exp they say in the movie but uh yeah i'm, I'm gonna I, all right i'm gonna stop myself and stop doing 
too many comparisons from the book to the yeah, movie, sure. but um, I really like the the opening scene. I think it, it's been a while since I saw it, but I think it was they have like all their troopers like arrayed out, and like the um the the messenger from the emperor shows up, to, like just basically just read a paper and say the the duke is now assigned to Rakis. It's all very you know mm-hmm. pomp and circumstance and whatnot. Yeah, it's really cool. It's really cool to see it. It's like a really interesting blend of like uh how we would see like older technology like i'm pretty sure the emperor's messengers reading from like a big scroll but like you still have the backdrop of like you know space troopers and you know starships and stuff so it, it's all really really cool it's a really blend good cool blend of like fantasy and sci-fi oh yeah it's perfect perfect space fantasy while still having like uh you know like ba- like basic hard science kind of in it you know like with the the water stuff on dune yeah, and it, and it's really fun. Um, it's I also appreciate that even after all the sci-fi stuff that has come out, obviously since Dune, um, in and you know its previous um, adaptations, I like that its style is its own. Like it's they didn't try and like copy like starships from like Star Wars or something, even though obviously that would be or Star Trek or anything like it's very um, stylized in its own way it it's not really comparable like, to anything else yeah it's stylized while also like like i don't know the, it's very uh i don't want to say like bare bones with the style but um i don't know like it's almost like uh i'm not sure how to describe it but the way the way everything looks is just very you know like uh slick like the um like when they're on Dune, like the in, the inside of the uh, the mansion, mm-hmm. you know, it's just very min- minimalistic. That's what I wanted to say. Oh, the nice. whole look of the movie is very minimal. Like this whole style, and it's like, yeah, just minimal while just you know doing the sci-fi space fantasy thing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, at first when I was watching it, I was kind of like, just kind of annoyed by all the yellow. I was like, oh, is this whole movie gonna be but then they do like just such um well the, the director he does such great work with shadows in the movie it's amazing like yeah like by the end of the movie i was just in love with like the whole look and color of you know everything like the dark parts of the movie are really dark and, you know the bright parts are really bright it's just really cool everything looks super realistic like the all the cg and everything just looks like photorealistic it's great oh yeah the cg it looks like just stellar it looks awesome uh but yeah back to the back to the plot um we we're introduced basically to more characters and everything we're introduced to um josh brolin who plays gurney Gurney Halleck. yeah he's basically like the one of uh paul's like mentor figures and he's like the I, I hate to say like generic, but you know he's the tough weapons trainer guy. Yeah, he's like he's like the commander of their forces, kind of, and then like the trainer for Paul. Yep. Yeah, and they they have a cool like uh, sword fight, and they explain like their technology, like their personal shielding and everything, and that's basically why they like everyone's reverted back to like using swords because uh, the personal shields have just like rendered like space lasers obsolete in the in the vast yeah. sense. Yeah, because um, they have like they have laser weapons, but they call them laser guns. Yeah. And uh, if it makes contact with a shield, there's a chance it could like set off like a nuclear reaction. It's basically a nuclear bomb. Yeah. So they they try to stay away from that. Yeah, and and it's a cool way of like you know kind of keeping that you know uh, again like f- fan more fantasy as opposed to like sci-fi kind of thing where like people are have gone back to using swords eight thousand years in the future. Yeah, it definitely you know lends to lots of just super awesome fight scenes great great uh choreographing with the fights it's really cool the shields look great yeah and so that's really cool and then we are also introduced to the weirdest named character in probably fiction um uh baby-faced um jason momoa as duncan idaho who is oh yeah paul basically paul's other mentor figure yeah, he's kind of like a sort of rogue soldier kind of dude. They have him go undercover with the Fremen to like 
you know, smoke them peace pipe and make alliances and whatnot. Yeah, and it's it's really cool. I really like to see that. Um, because uh, the Atreides, uh, they're the air quotes, like, good guys. Like, they want to be nice with, like, the natives of the planet and everything. Versus the Harkonnen, who are, I would assume, you know, bastards. Yeah. It's, yeah. Not so much that they want to be nice. It's just they're, you know, they're practical. Yeah. They it, see, yeah. You know, they see the Fremen as, like, a resource, you know? Yeah, as opposed to just something to shoot. And uh, and they do a very good job of explaining it in the movie, where it's like you know, the uh, Imperial Sardaukar are trained on a prison planet, and you know it's very tough conditions. And they're like, Dune is also super tough to live on. Ergo, the Fremen have been made like super awesome fighters, so they're like, we got to cultivate desert power to fight the Harkonnens. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, speaking of the Harkonnens, um, I really like not only the con like just the contrast between. <laughs> The Atreides and the Harkonnens, because the Atreides, um, basically to boil it down, they're all like good-looking people, and then the Harkonnens are all just disgusting and ugly. <laughs> like the Very bear, gross looking. yeah. Even, even like Dave Bautista, who's like a pretty like run-of-the-mill looking dude. Like they they uglyed him up. Uh, same with yeah, they just give him this like gross tinge on their skin. Yeah, they're they're not like normal like like peach colored. They're like gray and disgusting the baron is like gross and like obese but he can like float yeah yeah he has these things called suspensors underneath his robe that just like it's anti-gravity basically oh. yeah when i first watched that i thought he had like a really long like serpent body <laughs> and i was like oh oh awesome no, just uh he just floats and he has a really long robe yeah he just floats with the robe um yeah also really because he's really really fat yeah yeah, is is he described that way, like in like the novel, like just? Oh yeah, nice. He has to float around on suspensors and stuff. Yeah. Oh, nice, nice. Uh, so yeah, pretty much. Um, it, it does Paul do his little trial with the Benny Gesserit? Does he do that yep. when they're still on Caladan? Yep, it's all very yeah. All that a lot those scenes, a lot of the scenes are just taken straight out of the book. Nice. That scene, the the fight scene with Kearney. Nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Basically, he has to, he has to, put his hand in a pain box and not instinctively pull it. You know, react and pull his hand out to prove that he is a human and not an animal. Uh, basically, because only only animals, you know, instinctively, you know, move away from pain. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, I I remember that. Yeah, and I was like, oh, okay. So this is like his, his big one of his big tests uh, because. Yeah. Because they say that he has the voice at this point, right? Right, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's just one of his many abilities. But yeah, he's been... His mom was just training him, like, as in her ways, which has all this, like, cool, like, kind of spy sort of stuff attached to it. Because, uh, you know, the life the life of a... You know, of a futuristic, fe you know, feudal lord in space is very dangerous. So they have a whole school of chicks you know just trained out as like uh Bene Gesserit trained and i guess they they just marry him off to like you know lords and whatnot not marry him off but they you know give him out to lords and they like i guess they protect them stuff like that mm -hmm. yeah uh Very interesting yeah it's a really interesting part of it um that i wish they kind of would have delved a bit deeper into and yeah we yeah, kind of i think the movie tells you just enough that you can get the story like it just kind of boils it down to the real basic story of the book yeah which is fine you know lord of the rings did that and yeah i think uh some some certain people said oh this is not the next lord of the rings i think i think it's the next lord of the rings i think it did an amazing job of adapting the book yeah and speaking of like what, what other people have said I've, I've seen a lot of people like calling this movie like sequel bait but the movie calls itself part one. Right, like, yeah, and... So they made the movie, but they hadn't, like, the sequel hadn't gotten approved yet, but they still tacked on that part one. Hmm. But yeah, but it was successful, and I think it got approved for the sequel, like, the, the, the day after it premiered or something like that. Yeah, um, from what I've I've read, uh, the sequel comes out October of 2023. Hmm. So... Yeah, very exciting. Can't wait to see it. But uh, 
back to it. Um, so after the test, we basically have uh, the Atreides uh, going to Arrakis, and this is where we kind of get our first real looks at it. Uh, lots of wide shots. Everything looks great. They fly in and like, uh, aren't they like the little like flappy ship things? Yeah, they're called ornithopters or thopters. Or- ornithopters. Or yeah, yeah. Uh, very interesting. Um, I don't know. It yeah, reminds. It looks like a dragonfly. Yeah, it reminded me of something that would be like in Futurama. Oh. Hmm. Like I I, 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 I think it's interesting. I just like that it's kind of. Basically, like a little mini helicopter, doesn't really use like rockets. Yeah, I, like I, I, I think it's really cool. Yeah, I could just imagine like Professor Farnsworth. I've invented an om- or- ornithopter. <laughs> Good news, it's everyone! Just a dragonfly. Good news, uh, everyone! Yeah, like they're, they're... We're going to Arrakis. Yeah, they drop down in these giant ships, you know, and then we get to see like the whole you know cadre of uh, soldiers like walk out and like it's this huge like epic scene like this music yeah just, like yeah this, this would be a, a, a great time to mention it but um uh han zimmer did the music in this and it's amazing um yeah um so there's a part um it's either when they get to arrakis or it was earlier um but there's a guy playing a bagpipe and um i only know this because of like music classes i've taken but he's playing like so obviously, you know, bagpipes, it's a very Western European specifically, like we associate it with like Scotland and Ireland. Um, he's playing like Middle Eastern scales on a bagpipe, which was, it sounded really, really cool. And I think it's because our brains are so used to how a bagpipe should sound that when Hans Zimmer t- told the bagpipe player, here's what you're going to play, it, it just turned out awesome. It was uh very fitting for like the theme um the setting of dune um because i believe yeah. um frank herbert when I he was writing a very like kind of like melancholic sound yeah it was really melancholy but it was like in these uh middle eastern scales which sound very different uh which i think works really well because i think frank herbert was influenced a lot by like middle eastern cultures when he was writing dune oh yeah for sure yeah um, but yeah, and we basically find out after they get there that... Well, I, I want to oh. talk a little bit more about the music. Oh, yes, please. Um, I just thought it was just super, just like, understated and just fit the tone of the movie, like, so incredibly well. And yeah, it was just, it was just great. It was, you know, it like, it wasn't Star Wars music, and that was awesome. You know, it was like, just super moody, moody, broody music. Yeah, it worked. It worked super awesome. The soundtrack was very, very effective. But yeah, uh, so yeah, they arrive on Dune, and they're like, "Yo, we're at the function." Yeah, they basically show up and find out that like, uh, the Harkonnens left them like a shit show to like have to fix. Yeah, and um, you get a little bit of the. Uh, like you know the Paul like Messiah thing like the the Fremen that are the natives already kind of think um, like Paul is the uh, you know the Messiah or some some Messiah come you know because of the uh, he comes with his mom basically I guess yeah and basically I think you were talking about this before we started recording but isn't wasn't that prophecy like basically like not bred but like basically artificially put into their culture by like the Benny Gesserit. Yeah, they, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool in the book. They explain that it's like a whole, like it was like a whole uh, religious thing put onto the planet just in case, like, a, a Bene Gesserit ever needed to, like, take uh, shelter there or something like that. They could just, like, take advantage of the, um, take advantage of the religion in order to survive, pretty much. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's really, really cool. But they, yeah, they don't say that in the movie, but it's totally fine because the movie works anyway, and that's what's great about it. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if that's something that they touch on in the sequel. Yeah, they might go, yeah, might go deeper in on the lore for that. I'd like, to, I'd like to see how they do that. For sure. Yeah, I think the Benny Gesserit to me is probably like the most interesting thing that's like come out of Dune. At least more, like I said earlier, something that I want to see more. I want to see more of the Benny Gesserit. Give me like a Benny Gesserit yeah. spin-off film. Yep. 
it's kind of interesting. Uh, like uh, George Lucas doesn't cite Dune as one of his uh, like influences for Star Wars, but Star Wars has like a lot of Dune-like stuff in it, you know. Sure, like Tatooine, uh, spice, sand people, you know, Jedi having, you know, mind control powers. Stuff yeah, like that. but those things are fairly like common in like other fictions before Dune, because Dune. As, no, yeah, I definitely didn't invent, like, telekinesis and yeah. mind power stuff, but... Yeah, because I will say, um, and I guess kind of another reason why I never wanted to get into Dune, is people who were in, into Dune were kind of... They, they they always seemed to be kind of, like, dicks about it. And I'm like, oh, I don't know if I want to get into that. Um, but yeah, I could definitely see where George Lucas maybe was more, like, subconsciously... Like the Rick and Morty fans of, like, hardcore sci-fi, you know? You have to have, like, a high IQ to be into Dune. Oh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think Dune's really cool. Um, but yeah, from here we kind of get. Um, I really, really, I will say, I really loved the scene where Duke Leto was negotiating with the one uh, Fremen, like the Fremen leader. Yeah, um, very well acted, for sure. Yeah, I really liked it, and I like the. I don't know, maybe I'm just a sucker for it, but I like the culture clash between, like, the Duke and the Fremen, and he's kind of, like, like rather, he's, like, rather frank, and I guess kind of, yep. like, to, to us and to, like, the Atreides, he would be, like, impolite, but that's just how their culture is. It's just, like, two very different yep. cultures, like, interacting. You, you immediately get the point, you know, he, he spits at the feet of the Duke, everyone's immediately, like, insulted, and then someone has to like exp you know whisper and he's explain that was actually like a really nice thing he did there. <laughs> yeah, be because cause, because they're true. yeah because they're on a desert planet. And nobody wants to waste water. Yeah, water is very precious. They try yeah. So something like spitting, you know, would be seen as a uh, a gift. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a much bigger deal than like because like like we and thus our, like, audience inserts the Atreides, like, e everybody just spits every day. Like, oh, there's something in my teeth. Just spit it out. Uh, and so it's really cool to see. And obviously that makes sense. Like, they're they're a desert-faring culture that's, you know, lived on uh, Arrakis for however many thousands of years. So it would make sense that they would have, like, all these different customs and stuff. And so it's really, really cool. I really, really like to watch it and see those interacting. And again, uh, the Fremen and the Bene Gesserit are something I definitely want to see more of in the sequel. Obviously, the Fremen were <laughs> going to get a ton more. Yeah, and I and definitely, hopefully, like, we get some more, like, explicit, like, lore drops in the movie. But, uh, yeah, I really like the, yeah, the way they do Fremen super great in this movie really cool uh still suits look good oh yeah those, those yeah the whole yeah the whole aesthetic of this is just super cool um and then from here Again, everything kind of just ranges from being like yellow to brown and it looks great like you'd think it would get annoying but it just it just looks good yeah no it's it's awesome like the way everything looks is just it's just perfect um, and from here, we get to go on probably one of the other big uh, favorite parts for me, and that's where the Duke and Paul and Gurney go, and they basically take, like, the air tour of the planet, and they get mm -hmm. they get the lowdown of, like, hey, so harvesting spice is actually super dangerous because there are these giant worms that travel under the sand. Yep. And, yeah, they aren't, they are not kidding. The worms are, like, gigantic. Yeah, the worms are attracted to vibrations in the sand. So, of course, you know, digging up a whole bunch of spice in the sand is going to make a lot of vibrations. Yeah, and so basically, uh, to, to oversimplify it, like, the ships that they have for spice harvesting are basically just, like, giant vacuums, pretty much. And they just, like, vacuum up the sand, more or less. Right, yeah, yeah, filter out the spice and stuff. Yeah, yeah. filter out the spice, and then whenever a sandworm would be approaching... Normally, they would just, like, lift off and everything's fine because, haha, you idiot sandworm, we're in the sky. Uh, but, oh my goodness, this one time, uh, and just as it happens, the protagonists are there. Uh, one of the spice harvesters, I think its engine goes, like, kooky or something doesn't attach to it correctly. Yeah, yeah, so, um, or no, they, um, the thing they use, the carry-all, 
which like picks up the spice harvester, just like suddenly disappears and like where the hell did it go? Hmm. I thought their whole strategy is when the worms come, they just pick up the giant thing and like whoop, you know, do the whole ole. Yeah, I thought it was like one of like basically the cable thing like broke, and then they were just oh, gonna maybe, leave maybe him I'm there. Thinking of the book. And then they were just gonna leave him there because it's like, well, there's nothing else we can do. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, and obviously since the Atreides, they're the good guys. They're like, okay, we're gonna go and we're gonna load everyone onto our ships. Like before. Yeah, you the... get you get that. Okay, the Duke is like a, a man of uh, you know integrity, you know, willing to like sacrifice himself to save others, kind of thing. So yeah, very cool. Yeah, and so like they land down, and we get the. I I think it, it was just perfect, like the setting. Uh, um, and everything, the music and everything, it, it was all very, very tense. Obviously, I had no idea what was going to happen, uh, and so watching it was very fun, very tense. We have, like, the, basically this, like, ticking clock of, like, the sandworm getting close to it, and then Paul yep. gets basically exposed to, like, the spice in the air, and it, like, triggers his spiciness. Yeah, and, uh... <clears throat> not sh yeah, you, you basically get the point of why he's affected by the spice in the movie, but in the book they explain it's because he's, you know, the Kwisatz Heterak. He's been like trained as a, a Mentat and a, a Bene Gesserit. So when he's exposed to the spice, it, it, he's just totally, it like activates his like, um, it activates his ability, I guess, to see into the future. It turns on, like that. turns on God mode. Yeah, yeah, it's like, uh, yeah, it's basically a, a hallucinogen. <laughs> that actually doesn't it doesn't show you crazy hallucinations it shows you the actual future yeah and then we get uh gurney basically saves him at the last second as they're taking off uh ju just this shot of like the sandworm just like devouring like the spice harvester it's just like amazing it's gonna live on in like infamy as like one of the standout scenes uh from this film and it it's super great it just shows the scale because like the spice harvester it's like a big piece of machinery it's comparable to i don't know what would it be like comparable to uh like an oil rig i guess yeah yeah like an oil rig like imagine an oil rig just getting swallowed up like it's it's the scale of it is just so perfect and i yeah. love i love the um just the shot because you're just looking straight down as this thing emerges from the sand and you see all it's like teeth closing in around it and then yeah, just and, they're, and like, then just... they're standing on like the the plat the you know the what's the word you know the, like the landing platform thing I don't know what's called the door boarding ramp boarding ramp there we are yes and you see the whole thing yeah it's great that at that point in the movie I was like okay super into this now this is awesome oh yeah no like I I won't even lie like um like that sandworm scene like that that sold me on on the movie i was like okay yeah this is this is this is dope this is gas for sure mm -hmm. um yep yeah i really like it the design for the worms i think is better than the ones we see in like the covers of the books and everything and like other things i think this looks a lot scarier than some of the other ones that we see yeah, uh, or like designs just seems like what like a giant worm would look like. It just has this giant like, uh, like vortex of a mouth that's filled with teeth. Yeah, uh, it's yeah a lot scarier than some of like the more conventional like worms. The other ones kind of just look like snakes with like you know flap open mouths kind of. Yeah, yeah, I think this it, yeah it, this works a lot lot better in my opinion as like a scary space monster. Uh huh. And, uh, oh, we should talk about, um, so in this movie there's, like, vision, Paul has, like, visions and stuff, so you get those throughout. I like them, they're very well-directed. There was one at the beginning of the movie, Paul has one at the, uh, yeah, you know, the Spice Harvester thing. Yeah, yeah, he has one there, yeah, and the, the, the movie basically opens with a vision, and the narration of Zendaya's character. Doesn't very, it? uh, it's, or like, dreamlike, you know, yeah. the sequences. Yeah, it's it's really cool as opposed to like I'm glad they didn't go in like a weird like trippy hallucinogenic kind of like thing. I think this works the the visions here work a lot lot better. Um yeah, and pretty much for that first the first half of the movie or no for most of the movie he only sees Zendaya in those visions. Mhm. Mm 
And yeah, she looks great. Yeah, I think the Fremen, like, their whole thing and everything, they all look really, really cool. Um, it's... Again, like, just the aesthetic and design of, like, all the characters' costumes and everything, they're all really, really cool. And that that is um, doubly said for the Fremen, who all have, like, the cool, like, blue contact lenses or computer-generated eyes or however they did it. Yeah, yeah, the blue eyes from, from the Spice from Melange. The spice Melange. Um... But yeah, I and I, I forgot to mention it earlier, but I really like that kind of opening um, thing that Zendaya has before we're introduced to, like, Paul and everyone, where she's like, oh, well, who will our next oppressors be? And then Im it immediately cuts to Paul and the Atreides, because obviously, you know, like you were talk talking about earlier, they aren't necessarily, like, good guys. Like, they're the protagonists, but they aren't, like, they're not there for, like, to to make right. Dune like a to make a, a Rackus, like a better place like they're still there for like profit and they're still profiting off of the planet and like the natives there and everything. Yeah, the visions show us like the possible future where Paul, you know, basically it becomes like the Messiah leader of the Fremen and leads them against the Harkonnens, leads them against the entire galaxy in like a huge galactic jihad. Yeah. And I, I think it works works really, really well to show that, like, you know, the Atreides aren't, like, the be-all, like, good guys, like like Luke Skywalker is. So. Well, a big, well, a big part of the book is that Paul sees that future coming, you know, this, and he calls it, you know, ter his terrible purpose. Mm -hmm. And he sees it coming, and he's trying everything he can to stop it. But, uh, that doesn't really come into play until pretty much the end of the movie, after the movie. Yeah, you know, like the point the, where the movie ends and the book continues. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, from yeah, here movie we movie good. Yeah, movie good. But yeah, uh, continuing on, uh, there's like a little assassination attempt on Paul's life by a Harkonnen spy, which I yep. thought was really interesting. It's like a little like uh, I don't remember what the little thing's called. It's basically like mosquito oh, size. Seeker or something like yeah, that. the seeker. Yeah, it's like a mosquito size like kill drone, basically. Yeah, it uh, it pretty much it's designed to like slow burrow through a shield and like you know, poison whoever's hiding under it, sort of. And it, yeah, it seeks and then does that little drill. It does a little drill thing you see later on. But in that scene, yeah, Paul just like catches it like a bouse. Yeah, because he's the he's the protagonist with the voice powers. Mm -hmm. I, I love and I love all the uh, like we get. Like Fremen, uh, get Fremen information. Well, you know, from basically just from seeing Paul, like learning about them. You know, with his little hologram machine. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah! I really like that part too. It was really cool. And uh, there was a scene. There was a scene like that before they left Arrakis, I think, where he was like looking at the planets and it was like explaining everything. Yeah, yeah. I like that stuff. Yeah, they 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 did a really good job of like making learning about these things. Um, uh, Not painful. We, yeah, not painful. It's not just like expository, where like the expository dialogue. Yeah, where the Duke is like, "Hey, Paul, by the way, blah blah blah." Like we're learning about it in a way that Paul is learning about it as well. Yeah. Hey, Paul. By the way, we're rocking like right into a Harkonnen trap. So. Yeah. This sucks. Yeah, and it, it works really good. And then, basically, from here, um, I think there's a character who's like a traitor. Because Doctor Yue, Doctor Yue, because his wife is a captive, and so he disables um, Arakeen, the city that they're in, shields, which allows the Harkonnen and the Sardaukar troops to basically Sardaukar, Sardaukar to invade and overwhelm the uh, Atreides, yeah, uh, and we get like the I'm... big last. I, this, this battle scene, it's just like amazing. It's ba it's basically just one sided, but. Gurney, super yeah, super epic. Like Gurney leads, like basically, like the suicide charge. Yeah, they do this cool, like uh, it's basically the it's basically like if you got the ha hu ha ya thing from Army of Darkness, but made it like cool. <laughs> they're like Atreides, and they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. and then they like they're like moving up and down these stairs with like knives and shit. It's super cool. Yeah, yeah, no, it was it was awesome. Like this is probably like the best battle scene that we've had, and probably. Probably like the last three or four years. 
and it was dark without being like annoyingly dark yeah it was you know it was dark because it's night not dark because they're trying to like hide shortcomings yeah and you get to see this like super cool things where they're dropping these like slow penetration like bomb things onto their ships that are shielded and you just see the ship like blow up from the inside of the shield and freaking cool yeah and then um uh basically ua uh knocks out the duke and he's like yeah so i'm gonna deliver you to the baron because then they're gonna free my wife but what i'm gonna do for you i'm gonna replace one of your teeth with a poison gas capsule and you can basically just kill yourself and kill the duke and then dr ua is um then killed also as well yeah, he gets the classic, uh, you Double know, traitor cross. treatment. Your wife was dead the whole time, you asshole. You just betrayed your friends for nothing. What a <laughs> dick. Now you're dead. But yeah, uh, his character kind of, I guess, had to do that just because he loved his wife or whatever. And then, But then he also, at the same time, he wants to, he, he kind of knew he was going to get screwed over anyway. Mm -hmm. So he prepared the Duke. And uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of these scenes are just taken right out of the novel. Uh, we get this you know, this really creepy scene of Duke just like completely naked in front of the uh, the Baron who's just like eating this like whole feast. Yeah, was that just like uh, like that was just like an, an embarrassment thing, right? To just have Duke Leto just like naked in the chair, like drugged up. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, just kind of disrespect him. Yeah. Okay, that, that's what I figured. Um, I just didn't know if they went more into it in the books because in the movie oh, he no, kind of. Oh no, I I never assumed that, but like, because it's it's kind of you're left to assume that's what it is in the movie, and they don't really say like, hey, like probably, we. It was probably just to you know make sure he didn't have any weapons on him, just take yeah, his clothes yeah. off. Yeah, and it, you got to get that female viewer in, so you got to get you know Oscar Isaac, mm -hmm. you know, ninety nine percent yeah. naked. Oscar Isaac with beard is awesome. Yeah, he he looked good. He looked he looked. Did a, he did such a great job as uh, the Duke. Like, yeah, he did, really which... Cool. It, did, it didn't just seem like, you know, Poe Dameron with a beard. Yeah, I, I like it. He's very... Like you mentioned earlier, he's very stoic. He has a lot of integrity. Um, and it might have just been the... Definitely, he's definitely, like, the perfect actor to give off that vibe, for sure. Oh, yeah. Like, just... Um, in, in the book, does the Duke... Does he have a beard? Do they, like, mention uh, that? I think so. Okay. I'm not sure they, they he might he might not they might not have described him that well. I'm not sure. Okay. I I I just didn't know. I I assume that the beard was to like make him look a little bit older cuz I think Oscar Isaac's only he's like in his like early 40s, so I think it was to age him up a little bit. They gave him the beard. Yeah. And cuz you know, he's the dad in a fantasy thing. He's got to have a beard. Of course. Yeah. Um very ironic that they took away Jason Momoa's beard though. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I like that scene where he gets in the the ornithopter and starts flying around and wrecking shit. Oh yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, yeah. Duncan Idaho, he's like the cool action hero, basically. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the and, uh, the Harkonnens, see, like the Sardaukar fighting and stuff. They got these cool outfits and they speak this like like really cool sounding like alienish language. It just it makes them seem like aliens, even though they're basically humans. Uh, oh yeah, they're they're humans. They're just like uh, it kind of reminds me of. Um, like the death troopers from like rogue one how like when they speak their helmets like garble what they say oh right <laughs> yeah yeah so kind of similar uh, to that. I so like I... that scene where they're on the prison planet solace's secondus and uh they, you know they're getting ready they're getting like blood put on their foreheads or whatever oh yeah <laughs> and, and then the dude is like doing like throat singing oh, oh yeah oh yeah yeah uh, Hollywood blockbusters need more throat singing and bagpipes. Yes. Uh, such a cool movie. Yeah, but uh, and that from yeah, then super basically awesome action scene. Yeah, yeah, awesome action scene. Uh, the Harkonnens end up capturing Paul and his mother, and they basically are like, instead of just shooting you, we're going to do the evil thing and bring you up to the desert to die slowly. Because, you know, oh, we, we have these knives and we could just stab you to death. But no, we're going to fly you into the desert to die. Yeah. Um, in the book, it's explained that the Baron, he, he just can't personally know how they die. And that way he can have plausible deniability. Mm -hmm. That's why he just sends them off to die. 
Okay. Yeah, yeah, basically they do the Dr. Evil, you know, I'm gonna walk away while you're in the Shark Tank thing. Yeah, that was about one of the only things. Um, and yeah, and, and I'm sure they say that in the movie. It's just, I remember being like, oh, they're doing the, the villain thing. Um, and on the flight there, basically, um, Paul and his mom are able to overpower their captors using the Benny Gesserit voice. Yeah, we get to see, like, some... They're using, like, hand signals and stuff like that. And, like, uh, he's having to, like, adjust the way his his voice power works. He has to, like, a, a, tune it to, you know, each, like, individual person he tries to control. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, it works out. And, it, and, like, he has to, like... In the, in the movie, it's really cool because he kind of, like... He adjusts, it, he adjusts his voice to sound more like the, you know, the alien dudes, the Harkonnens. Mm-hmm. That was cool. Yeah, it, it was really cool to see how that works. Um, and basically after that, they are, they end up finding a survival kit that Dr. Yua left for him, and they spend a night in a tent where Paul trips balls. Yeah, uh, cause there's like spice in the tent, so yeah, he's like, I see in the future and stuff like that, we just get this really great scene from him where he's like, kind of freaking out, you know, people screaming my name, da, 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 da. I was like, whoa. Yeah, it was, it was really cool to see, um, because there's so many times where like, um, when, when like people in fiction have visions, they just like roll their eyes back and then kind of just sit there. But Paul, he's having like physical reactions. Uh, he's telling like his mother what he's seeing and basically, yeah, he envisions like the whole, like the jihad spreading across the universe in his name. Indeed. And he's like, no bueno, let's not do that. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, we get to see, yeah, he, yeah, they were left what uh, the book's called a Frem kit. I like I like that name. You know, Fremen Frem kit. Oh, and, nice. Uh, comes with all the special Fremen stuff. They got steel suits. They got thumpers. I like when they come out of the the little thing. They're like covered in sand. Got to dig their way out, and then um, you see like this little field mouse thing, like mm -hmm. sand mouse. It's called a uh, and the name of the mouse is a Muad'Dib. And uh, in Fremen, it means the one who points the way, because kind of the oh well, yeah we get to, oh yeah we see uh, like the moisture being sucked away from the sand, mm -hmm. you know. Yep, that was just so cool. Yeah, it, it all is the whole uh, scene after the or the whole just like sequence after they like escape the the Harkonnen is is just awesome. And then I think we skipped over when it happens, but basically. Um, yeah, when Duke Leto is, like, he's there naked, and he, the the Baron basically, uh, Harkonnen basically just ends up, like, taunting him and being like, ha ha, you suck. And then uh, Leto releases the poison gas, and he kills himself, and he kills pretty much everyone except the Baron. But we assume we think the Baron's dead. Right, yeah. yeah. Later yeah. on we find out he's alive, and that, you know, they only, they only killed uh, the Baron's Mentat, who is played by Polka Dot Man. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so, so that was all good, and then we get the scenes where the Baron hands over Arrakis to Batista. And he yeah, and one, of, one, of my, uh, one of my favorite lines in the movie, he's like, I want you to squeeze, Robin. I want you to squeeze. Squeeze yeah. hard. Because and... basically they just, uh, they just spent like a buttload of money, you know, invading the place. Yeah, so they're yeah they're gonna spell sell like all the stuff spice and restart production to recover the cost of taking Arrakis back over, and then we get the nice scene where Paul and his mom are found by Duncan and uh, I think some other just members of the Atreides household, and they head to a old research research station, but they were tracked by the Sardaukar, and we get the epic. Duncan sacrifice scene. Yeah, the Sardaukar show up, and we get to see this really cool sequence where they're kind of like floating down, like using they're using the same suspensors that power the Baron's uh, like floaty technology. That you know that scene where they're all like gently like kind of like floating down. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And uh, yeah, and we get a super awesome last stand fight scene with Duncan. He's just like murking dudes and shields. Yeah, and really then. Cool. Yeah, and there, there was literally a scene where, like, you just assume he's dead, but then he just, like, oh, yeah. sh he gets back up and he's like, ah, huh, what up? I kill, like, ten more of you. Yeah. I'm Jason Momoa. I'm a badass. 
I exclusively play like badass fighter characters. Oh, now I'm dead. <laughs> and yeah, so then we yeah, get then they to... have to ski daddle out of there, and uh, they basically just have they basically fly into a storm to escape. Yeah, basically just in order to like avoid being trapped, they fly into like a storm, and um, I think one of the doctors attempts to like call in a sandworm to like ride. Or something, but she gets ambushed by the Sardaukars, and oh, then yeah. the worm eats them all. Yeah, I really like that scene where she just she's like uh, surrounded by the Sardaukar, and then she's like she just like pow- starts pounding the sand. Oh yeah, boom, 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 and then the the you know thing shows up and really. eats them all. And then we get Paul and his mom running around in the desert, and they also encounter a sandworm. Yeah, uh, do not remember that part. Do they not? I I might be misremembering. I thought they meet like they run into like a worm, and I just it's remember like them about having to eat them, and then the it, desert it walk or yeah, they do the desert under. walk. Maybe I don't know. Maybe I was thinking of the earlier part. I don't know. But yeah, basically they get they meet up with the Fremen, and we finally uh, uh, Paul gets to meet up with Shawnee. I believe her name is played by Zendaya, the yeah. woman who has been in his visions. Yeah, and she is, uh, she, she looks pretty good in this. I liked, I liked her whole look. She looked really cool in the outfit with the blue eyes. Yeah, and they all have, like, the nose tubes. Yeah, nose tubes be looking cool. Yeah, so they, they all look really cool. And then uh, after yeah, they, they reach I them... Yeah, I guess we talk about, like, the still suits. It's like the Fremen, it, like, the still suit, it, like, takes, like, all your moisture, you know, like, nose moisture, mouth moisture, whatever, and, they all, and like, you know, your piss and your shit and all that just... It somehow recycles it using like basically uh you know self-charging battery technology you know self-pumping action right with you know by walking they like they're like filtering everything and then they get they get all their water put back in by like a little tube yeah like just like drink from yep and they only use a thimble only lose a thimble of water a day when they're using a still suit so it recycles water that well yeah which is basically how the fremen are able to like survive in like the middle of the desert yeah, without, like, a regular kind of water source, yep. Water yeah. is very precious. Yeah, so no. precious, in fact, that when they run across some random people, they're like, all right, we're going to kill you for your water. Oh, yeah. And then we get kind of one of those scenes where um, one of the warriors, the Fremen warriors, like, objects to um, Paul and his mom being, like, allowed to go with them, and Paul gets to have his big fight scene where he kills... The random guy. Yeah, and, then, and uh, it's basically kind of. Uh, so he. Look, well, yeah. At first, they think he's literally like he's kind of like teasing the dude by like, you know, not killing him and just saying like, "Do you yield?" Um, but then they like uh, the mom explains that that was his first kill, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Dude, and everyone's like, "Whoa!" And he's putting their hands on him for some reason. Yeah, and he's. He's welcomed into the Fremen, and yeah, his mom doesn't want him to, but Paul insists because he's going to bring peace to Arrakis. He's going to, you know, but I'm pretty sure the movie says that he, he's basically going to, or at least it tells you enough that you you know that Paul is going with the Fremen to kind of cultivate desert power and, like, you know, eventually fight back against the Harkonnens. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, the movie basically just ends with uh, Paul... Paul, Mom, and uh, Chani just walking off in a cool little line, and a really great shot. And um, that whole scene, the whole scene with um, you know where Paul kills a dude, it's just like for for me, it was like the emotional climax of the movie. Mm-hmm. And ending it right there was just it was all perfect for me. I just it was great. Yeah, it was it was a great point to end the movie. I think it set up the sequel well, or rather, not even the sequel, like the second part to like yeah. the 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 first. Oh, yeah, part two of the first book. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I'm super, super excited for it. So yeah, if you have not seen Dune, uh, go watch it. It's awesome. It's great. It's stupendous. Probably uh, one of my favorite movies that came out last year. Yeah, I think it's definitely just immediately in my top favorite sci-fi movies of all time. You know, right up there with Star Wars, Star Trek. It's instantly, it's instant classic. Really great. Yeah, 
really really fun um it's on hbo still so if you have hbo uh go watch uh, it is it i don't think it is is no. it not oh never mind then buy it digitally or rent it on amazon or something yeah it's 2022 there's a million ways to watch this movie uh, but, indeed but yeah that's that's a that's about it from us on dune uh super great movie excited for it and i hope that they can uh bring this series at least the main dune stuff uh to the big screen i think they would do a great job of it oh yeah for sure and yeah so uh without any further ado this has been cade from the lore council signing off yeah, and this is Keith, and we'll uh, we'll see y'all later.